From Chicago's Can TV, this is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there, and welcome to Chicago Newsroom here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis, and today, this day, we begin an ambitious new 10 part series that could, before it's over, become a, I don't know, 12, maybe an 18 part series. It's our effort to invite every announced candidate for mayor of Chicago to this table for a relaxed, hopefully enlightening conversation about Chicago, what's right, what's wrong and uh, what convinces this individual that they can make our city a better place in which to live. Now, that's a tall order, but we're off to a really great start today. Paul Vallis was Richard M. Daly's finance director and budget director from the earliest days back in 89 till about 95 when he left the mayor's office to become the first CEO of that newly constituted Chicago Public Schools reorganized to be, for the first time, directly under mayoral control. Paul Vallis served as CEO from 95 till about 01. Then he left that job to run for governor of Illinois. And oh, he lost to Ron Blagojevich by three percentage points in the primary. Blagojevich went on to win the election in 02. And then later Vallis went on to run the New Orleans schools. And then that was after Hurricane Katrina. And then for a short time at Bridgeport, Connecticut, he also consulted on school reconstruction in Haiti, became known nationally as a competent leader for troubled school systems. And a little more than a week ago, Paul Vallis announced that he was going to challenge Rahm Emanuel in next year's mayoral election. So it is our supreme honor to have Paul Vallis at the table to kick off our 10-part series. Well, thanks for having me. 10-part with the rate that Kennedy turned into this race. It could be a 20-part series by I the time we're done. I, I don't know. <laughs> We've bitten off more than we can obviously chew on a weekly show because we'll probably have one every, you know. But anyway, yes. Um, that in itself is an interesting issue, the way lots and lots of people are, are coming into the race. That kind of says something about the feelings that they have about the mayoralty. I mean, um, you know, very often you don't see that level of, of challenge. But before we start all this mayoral talk, um, as we are speaking right now, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama are marshalling the troops, getting as many people as they can into the city council chambers because the plan commission today is going to take the vote on the Barack Obama presidential library in Jackson Park. And I just wondered if you, if you had any thoughts about it. I mean, it's, it's become much more controversial than I sort of thought it would, and there's a lot of reasons why it should be controversial. So what do you think? Well, I think the Planning Commission's probably going to approve it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> the, I, the former chief right. of staff uh, pointed and think, them? And I think some of the more controversial issues were, were beyond the point of where it should have been located or, you know, those who felt it, it might have been located elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, look, it, it's, an important, uh, it, it's important to have the library here. It, it, it's, it's important to, uh, uh, to the community. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think it's a huge... I, I think it could be a huge boon from an economic development standpoint. Any anytime you have a presidential library, they become kind of economic drivers. Uh, you know, I think there are some issues that remain to be resolved. I mean, the issue of uh, uh, you know the issue of Cornell Drive. Mm -hmm. I don't think Cornell Drive should be closed, but I think they're talking about some sort of a comp uh, you know some sort of compromise maybe in their own drive. And and you know obviously their sensitivity over some issues, uh, uh, some of the larger issues like whether or not if they have the uh, if they consolidate the land to have that you know signature golf course whether or not mm -hmm. it's going to be as accessible financially yeah. to people in the community I think those issues will work themselves out because the public will demand that they get resolved but at the end of the day we're fortunate to have the library and we're fortunate to uh, and you know we're fortunate to obviously uh, um, have have uh, an entity like that that can really become an economic driver. So if you're elected, you'll probably be there for the opening ceremony. I probably, hopefully, I will. Yeah. I, I certainly yeah. anticipate uh, being there. And, and you know, uh, they've raised issues about the funding of the library and how much of a public subsidy there should be for infrastructure. I think these type of projects generate a lot of financial interest. I mean, mm -hmm. when the mayor built Millennium Park, um, he raised uh, what was it? Uh, $180 million or something like that. At least close to 200 yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, anytime you have a made. So mm -hmm. I, I, don't think ta I don't think the Chicago, ta the hard-pressed Chicago taxpayers are going to have to foot the, the, the larger bill for the library, I think. Obviously, the state needs to play an important role. And a project like this, by its nature, 
yeah, is, is going to and should be able to attract uh, considerable uh, financial contributions, just not obviously from the Chicago area, but nationally, if not internationally. So mm -hmm. I anticipate that uh, these issues will work themselves out. Well, okay, so um, yesterday, not today, but yesterday, the 16th, was a big anniversary for Chicago. It was Mayor Rahm Emanuel's first inauguration. Uh, that was in 2011. I'll give you the softball beginning to the <laughs> interview. Uh, is Chicago better off ever for having had Mayor Emanuel for seven years? No, no. I think Chicago's worse off. Um, I think we're worse off financially. We're certainly worse off when it comes to public safety. Look, we've had more murders. We have more murders in Chicago than LA and New York combined. Uh, uh, from an economic development standpoint, our job growth is about half the national rate. Did you know that our property values in the city uh, are, are actually uh, significantly below the 2008 recession were nationally they're they're I think seven or eight percent above in terms of net property values uh, and uh, and I, I just think the city continues to struggle I, obviously we have serious infrastructure problems and I'm not talking about the macro infrastructure issues but I'm talking about the micro infrastructure issues things that impact working families look uh, they just announced the other day that they're going to have to uh, that they're going to close the water fountains in the park. You know, the water fountains that we used to drink, mm -hmm. <laughs> drink out of when we used to, you know, ramble around the park right, and right. you know join our little league and participate in, you know, uh, when we were young kids uh, because of lead contamination. I mean, the, so there are a lot of issues that have failed to uh, to be addressed. There are, if you look from an economic development standpoint, certainly we have the mega pro projects. But you know, what about the west side or the south side of Chicago? They build a wind trust stadium, $175 million at, at McCormick Place, and they use $100 million in TIF money that's supposed to be used for um, economically hard-pressed areas, and they use it to build a stadium for DePaul when, when Jerry Reinsdorf uh, offered the use of the, uh, of, of the United Center for free. And, and yet the, the Pullman, um, you know, the, the Pullman-Roseland area remains significantly uh, uh, you know, uh, neglected. Uh, yeah. Chicago State University continues to have significant infrastructure problems. So I, I just think that the priorities have really been out of whack and you see no long-term strategy. You don't see it when it comes to the financial planning. You don't see it when it comes to public safety. Um, you, you know, I, I had a press conference up earlier this week where I talked about What's happened to the police department over the last seven years? The fact that uh, we've attrited out police positions. The fact that they literally had allowed the detectives division to uh, to uh, uh, lose so many re so many uh, members through retirements and through the failure to replace the retired detectives mm -hmm. that the detectives uh, force the detectives division had dropped from 1,200 to to below 700. So, so those are issues that we've simply failed to, right, uh, right. to address. So I see, I don't see any direction. I, I don't see any long-term planning, whether it's the schools, whether it's uh, public safety, whether it's neighborhood infrastructure, uh, whether it's um, uh, long-term financial uh, 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 budget planning. Mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, there's an absence of those things. I, I, wanted, I want us to try to the extent we can with the time we have today to try to get into some real depth about each of these things sure. uh, because we're kind of skimming over the top. But you did indeed have a, a, a press event a week ago talking about public safety and I'd really like to dive into that. Okay. Of course we want to talk about education, of course we want to talk about all the other things, but let's let's focus on this, on this issue with the police. Sure. You're talking about getting the police force back up to about 13,005, I believe, right? Well, the, I mean, I, 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 you, want to, you want to add more police, let's put it that way. You know, the, what I laid out is much more comprehensive than that. So let me explain and I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, let's, I'll try to, let's get into it. I'll try to be concise. Mm -hmm. the, um, uh, and, try and, to be and, which is always hard. I know I've heard you. I've heard your self-deprecation uh, about about how you I can't know, be. I can't help can't myself. Well, well, there's two of us, so let's have a good time. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, I don't think you need to be condescending to right. uh, to the public, and I think right. uh, you know people. People want detailed explanations. I can handle complex sentences. When it's you okay. say you're going to prove public safety, and if you give a long explanation, they want to hear the details. Right. But uh, they may not remember all the details, but at least they'll come yeah. away uh, um, feeling that. It, you know, you're you're not trying to dummy down things because right. the public doesn't need to be dummy down to, and, and and so you know. But let me just say this: my press conference this week 
was to talk about what we need to do to strengthen and revitalize the police department. You know, I'm going to have a press conference next week where I'm going to talk about what we failed to do to address this issue, these root causes of crime, and, and, and I'm going to offer very specific uh, proposals for addressing that issue. The mayor called it your, your, your proposal policing without, yeah, uh, yeah. without prevention. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a good rhetoric. He refers to the four Ps. I, I, I'd be more happy to critique his four Ps. So, uh, so the press conference was to focus on the police uh, because the bottom line is we have, in effect, allowed our police department to be gutted. And, and, and when the police don't have enough resources, when the police, when you, you've, you've gutted your detectives division, literally almost cut it in half, uh, when you have, uh, when you've allowed the, uh, through attrition, the supervisory infrastructure to significantly deteriorate, where at one time we had one sergeant for every 30 officers, we'll supposed to have one for every 10. When police officers don't have working radios and working cameras, when, when we waited six years to par start putting tasers into the hands of our police officers, and we had like 700 tasers, I think, six, seven years ago, where in New York City have 15,000. Uh, so, so the, you know, the police, when faced with, a, with uh, the possibility of having to use their weapons, doesn't have an alternative to the use of lethal force. And I'm not justifying in any way, <laughs> you know, the use of, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not defending the use of lethal force. I'm saying we've got to give our police officers the alternatives. When you have all those things, when you have all those things, um, you wonder why uh, crime is escalating. You know, when you, have a, uh, when you have a police department that doesn't have enough officers so that you can't maintain beat integrity, that means officers are basically being drawn from district to district to deal with whatever hotspot is out there because you've in fact dismantled these special units, these, uh, you know, the specialty units, so to speak. So you're drawing from the diminished number of beat officers in every district and you're sending them uh, you know, to other districts, paying them overtime to other areas of the city that they're not familiar with or for that matter into communities that are not familiar with them. Uh, that has contributed, I believe, that has contributed uh, to the uh, escalating crime rate. The, 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 the increase in murders over the past few years, uh, particularly the increase uh, in uh, carjackings, you look at the statistics. Uh, so so uh, what, I did on, uh, what I did on Monday... Hold on. Yes. I want to just stop you here Please. because um, y you're getting so far ahead of us and I want to I just kind of stop periodically and just go back and pick, pick through the details of this, yes. okay? Okay. All right. You're a budget guy. You were the city's budget guy for, for, uh, for quite a few years. My understanding of it is that the police department as it currently exists takes about a third of the total city budget, does it not? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, well, the public safety budget. The public safety yeah. budget, yeah. So in a way, we have a kind of an analogy to our national debate about the Defense Department. Uh, a, a huge amount of our resources does go into the police department now. So if you are talking about, and sometimes quoted you as saying that you're going to have to invest at least $100 million more. Actually, yeah, it's actually $75 million. Okay, well, it's a lot of money. A lot of money that, has to, that, that you're going to need to jack up the cost of the police department, which would mean that the percentage of the police budget will go even higher. So let me explain. And that money has to come from somewhere. Right, so let me explain. Let me explain what, what I... But, excuse me, I didn't quite get to my question, which, oh, yes, is, which is, do you feel that we need to put more resources into police? Uh, yes, I do, absolutely. Okay. all right. Yeah, and why is that? Well, you know, first of all, not only did I lay out my specific proposals, but I also articulated... How I, uh, how I would pay for them. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the good thing about having uh, 45 minutes to talk about these things instead of five is you can actually do them justice. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so let me explain what I was going to, let me summarize quickly what I was going to try to do and then, uh, or what I intend on doing and then how I'm going to pay for it. First of all, uh, I believe we need a, a police force of 14,000. Uh, 14, 14, and, and I believe we need 1,200 1, detectives. And we need to bring back retired detectives because we have a clearance rate on, mm -hmm. on, on shootings of 
and a murder, a clearance rate on murders of 17 percent. We talk about that all the that's time. That's right, and, and that's horrendous. And, and, and you compare that to any other cities, that is absolutely horrendous. And, and that is because of diminished resources. I also said that we need to build up the supervisory infrastructure right. so we have enough sergeants and training officers. When you don't have enough officers, and officers are getting worn out, and officers are being moved from city to city, I mean from district to district, and officers are working overtime. These are extre extremely stressful jobs. And, and I've had four police officers in my family, including my two, my, my two sons. That has an impact. And your wife. And my wife was a former police officer. And, uh, and that has an impact. That, uh, that wears you down. And when you don't have that infrastructure, that command and control structure in place, uh, that leads to accountability issues. So right. it's important to invest in the police department so you can have beat integrity, you can have the flex these flexible units that can go into the hot spots without drawing officers from one district, from one hard press district, and sending them to another, uh, another district that they're not familiar with. Sometimes just to sit in cars, they, like scarecrows. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that, and th this is what the officers tell me. Uh, and it's important to have that supervisory infrastructure in place. And it is important that they have working cameras and that they have tasers and that they're trained in in how to use the tasers and that they're trained in how to deal with. Uh, individuals who have mental health issues and things like that, uh, you know, uh, so uh, you know, it's uh, so that they have the proportional responses, so that they have they they are trained in de-escalation, uh, etc. These things are absolutely critical, and, and I feel I feel that that will provide the resources, the the adequate numbers and the adequate infrastructure, so that the police can not only be more effective, but the police can also be uh, so. Uh, but so that there can also be greater accountability. Because without the resources and the uh, command and control infrastructure, yeah. uh, you not only lose effectiveness, but you also lose accountability. Now, how are we gonna pay for that? Well, let's just say that for purposes of this conversation, all the people who are yelling at their TVs and their phones right now about what about prevention and what about all the other stuff, we're setting that discussion aside for now because we're going to focus on the fact that there are problems with the police department, right? Well, so I just, I just want to get yes. that, make that clear. Absolutely, I, absolutely. But because we're talking about the police department now, right. uh, next, next week I will be laying out what we're going to do okay. to do prevention because right. what I'm trying to do that's stipulated that I, I, is I'm trying to deal with these issues uh, in detail so the public knows right. I understand right exactly right. now okay the police department began to be diminished at as early as as 07 and 08 because of financial reasons mayor Daly uh, began letting the police department What's the word? A trite, I guess. Attrition. Attrition. Uh, allowing attrition, and and the, so when when Emmanuel got into office, he had a reduced police department, and he said he was going to hire a thousand police officers, and then and he, he didn't. Ran into, and he didn't. He and he ran, eliminated. He ran into all large kinds of positions. budgetary issues that, you know, that made it very difficult to do. My question yes. is again. This is, it's. It's easy when you're on the campaign trail to say you want to have more police, but then when you get into office and you discover that, oh, we're $200 million behind in this pension fund and all the rest, right, so everybody else is standing there with their So let me respond. Out. How do you do it? You know, if it's year three and you're gearing up to run next year, you might have an excuse, but it's year seven now. Mm -hmm. We're now entering year eight. And, uh, and for the first term, Emmanuel made none of the tough financial decisions. He didn't go to the legislature to get uh, uh, equity funding for for uh, Chicago teachers, which is costing taxpayers, you know, about you know I would say 200, 250 million dollars a year. Be he got it in 2017, but I mean, because of that delay. That's right. Because, because of, of that delay. delay. In getting I mean, the Pat Quinn was governor. You had an elected Democratic governor. You had almost a veto-proof House and Senate. He could have gotten it in. Uh, Daley could have gotten it in 2010. Rahm Emanuel could have gotten it in 2011. Uh, you know, he, he pushed for <laughs> he pushed for another Prince and Holiday in 2013, which Quinn rejected. Mm -hmm. but, but at the end of the day, he could have taken action. Uh, uh, secondly, he made none of the tough decisions on the tax and fee increases, uh, decisions that were deferred until the next term. I mean, when Chewy ran against him, Chewy was talking about the need, uh, how it was going to be important to raise taxes, and how we were going to ha how he had this cliff that we needed to address, and and mm -hmm. you know and. He, he got nothing but attack ads from, from Emmanuel. So at the end of the day, by punting four years, uh, uh, it, it put us in this trick bag where 
he couldn't fill police positions. So he finally actually took the, the positions out of the budget altogether. And he didn't do the things needed to make sure that the police department had the resources they needed to effectively, mm -hmm. to effectively deal with the uh, 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 rising crime rate. And, 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 and so that failure to act uh, not only escalated the problem, but it also made the solution more expensive. Mm -hmm. Because by waiting four to five years to raise taxes to deal with the pension issue, or for that matter, waiting uh, almost six, uh, what, six years to get the legislature to, to provide some equity in the funding of teachers, uh, of Chicago teachers' pension, same type, type of funding they provide to the, uh, to the downstate teachers, well, that's going to cost us over the long run probably over a billion dollars in additional in additional uh, money that taxpayers uh, will have to pay uh, because, because of, those of delays. the delay yeah, because, so that was totally unacceptable so this is at the end that we're, we're nearing the end of of uh, of you know his second term at seven years maybe you can use that excuse or that excuse uh, held some water uh, you know, in the middle or the third year of his first term, but th this right now is year seven. But as you've as you've brought up, um, this didn't start with Rahm Emanuel. This this kicking the can down the road thing was was uh, a sort of a hallmark of the latter years of the Daly administration in almost every way. Well, look, I I'm not suggesting that uh, Emanuel didn't inherit certain problems. When I took over to Chicago Public Schools, uh, we had a structural deficit of one. Point two billion dollars, five-year deficit. Did you ever hear me say, "Well, that was R.G. Johnson. That was my predecessor." Oh my God! Look at the problems that they left with me. Deteriorating buildings, as as best as contamination, in 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 something like a uh, hundred schools. I mean, you know. In, in fact, I don't think I ever mentioned my predecessor's name. I just focused on the problem. So six years later, I had forgotten that, R.G. Johnson. That's right. Actually. Six. See, yeah. it, her name hasn't been mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> Since you know, yeah. since I became superintendent, and, and and you know, and so I didn't blame her because first of all, it wasn't her fault to begin with. But but uh, you know, I just made the tough decisions, and I made the tough decisions early enough so that so that when I left the schools after six years, we had we had cash reserves in the operating budget of something like five hundred fifty million dollars. We had twelve bond rating upgrades. Contrary to what the mayor says, we had a fully funded pension system so and, and we also we also renovated over 350 schools uh, so so we had success so you know uh, the mayor knew what he was getting into when he ran I, I, I've heard you uh, I've heard many of your radio interviews and and your other interviews over the last week or two and when you get to this point in the conversation my reaction is you know there was, there have been, there's been a major dividing line in all of this. I was working in the Daly administration in those 90s, that's around, right, that's we around 96 when uh, the Democratic Convention came to Chicago. Oh, yes. And I know you were budget director, but it was, it almost felt like you could just open a desk drawer and take a stack of hundred dollar bills out of there. There was, there was money. The city was wealthy in those days. The, 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 the nation was wealthy. There was, there was a lot of money around. After 2008, everything changed. And Mayor Daley was more than willing to spend money in those years when you were superintendent. I don't mean to diminish what you did. By the way, may I say that I think that the accomplishment that you and Gary Chico did with the reconstruction of all those buildings was spectacular, and I thank you for it. But it was a different time. There was money to do it, and, and you could raise money well, in ways that you can't do today. There are all sorts of cities that have booming economies. Look at New York. Look at L.A., I mean, there there are there are all sorts of cities that are not facing the spike in crime that we're facing, that are not experiencing the type of infrastructure deterioration that we're experiencing. The bottom line is, look, every single job I've taken has been an, an entity in crisis. I mean, I went to, you know, I went to New Orleans after Katrina, uh, and uh, to, and I had a city that literally couldn't open schools, and, uh, you know, I had to, I didn't make excuses. I. I tackled the problem. I, I made things better. You know, today, today there are very few failing schools in New Orleans, and every single student is either in a new building or a reconstructed building. I, you know, I, so so my point is, don't run if if your 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 defense for your 
your inadequacies are going to be to blame the other person. See, that's what they do. You know, when you listen to the mayor's office, they take credit for rising test scores to the IB programs, which I opened, uh, for the military academy. You go through all the litany of things that, that they take. I mean, that's the D.C. approach. You take credit for things that you perhaps were not responsible for or that you should share the responsibility with your predecessors. And then you blame your predecessors. You blame your predecessors for all your problems. It's year seven. It, it, the clock is ticking now, going on seven years. You know, Mayor Daley didn't make the decision to invest $175 million in the Wood Trust Arena. Mayor Daley didn't make the decision to delay uh, uh, um, uh, opening or creating a developer's fee till 2016 uh, so that uh, they could say that they were using those fees to invest those monies in, 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 um, in in communities, in, in, in the neighborhoods on the west side and the south side. But Mayor Daley vastly expanded the TIF program and, and took it into some areas where I think many people well, there's would no say doubt. He, it, it, just became, it just became a slush fund. I mean, there's, so, so, right. so what do we... It's, it, I guess it's really complicated is well, what I'm trying I, to say. I, I'm not saying that it's the, not complicated. The, there, are, there, there are no just clear villains in this uh, or clear heroes. Well, We've got a very complicated city to run here. I'm not running against Mayor Daley. I know you're not. Mayor Daly's retired. Yeah, yeah. I don't think another Daly is planning on running. <laughs> although, well, although you never know. We have so many know. people that are in this race. <laughs> because remember, it's an open primary, which yeah, means you don't yeah. have to have party affiliations. But my point is, look, we're running against, you know, I'm running against Rahm Emanuel. Yeah, I understand. And, 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 and I, I'm talking about what we need to do to move the, the city forward. Look. You know, you know, I'm going to talk at length and in great detail about how to get at the root causes of crime. I'm going to talk about the issue of the, the, the inadequacies at the Chicago. Look, the state just took, took over special education. I right. mean, so, so my point is we have, a lot of, we have a lot of issues and we have a lot of problems that I'm going to speak to during the, during the course of this, what, over the next 10 months. But, but let me talk about public safety. Uh, See, you know, I, I, I actually spent the last two days putting up lists of things that I thought we should talk about in okay. some approximate right. order. I, know, I knew it would get blown out of the water immediately, but it's like I don't, I, I'm getting really jealous of the time here. And I know, we're, I apologize. We're, no, 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 you don't have to apologize. We both want to talk about everything. Um, I, I don't want to get off of the police thing, though, because... No, I, because I want to explain how I'm going to pay. All let's right. talk about how we finance it. You know what? Let's not. Let's, let's, just, let's just... Even if I can explain it in five minutes? <laughs> can you do it in two? All right, I'll try All to right. do it in Come two. Come on, because right. I, there, there are other issues besides how you're going to pay for it, and I don't want to get too hung up on that. No, no, but, uh, but look, you know, the, the, your follow-up questions have all focused on the financial mess yes, that, that Rahm Emanuel has inherited. Right. So how can I be talking about strengthening the police department? Right during a period of financial distress. Yeah. All right, so, so this is the point. Uh, look, public safety is, is, is probably, is priority number one in any city. Uh, at the end of the day, the schools have independent sources of funding, although the city's ha city has had to bail out the schools over the past few years, something they never had to do when I was there. Uh, but, but the bottom line is public safety clearly is critical. I mean, it's, you know, that's, you know, they, it's the biggest part of the city's budget, et cetera. So, so uh, what I've essentially said is there's a way to strengthen the police department and improve effectiveness and accountability and m ensure that all districts have the resources they need to, uh, to, to, to support public safety efforts in partnership and in cooper in, 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 with the uh, community. But this is how you pay for it. Uh, f first of all, uh, when I was city budget director, the most we ever paid on overtime was $35 million. And in present dollars, in inflation adjusted present dollars, that was $56, $57 million. I mean, we have had overtime budgets in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. If you staffed adequately and consistently, uh, consistently and, and you didn't have to draw police officers from one district to another and give them overtime to handle certain beats, you could probably save close to $40, $50 million a year. That's, that's number one. Let's just, let's just, let's just reemphasize that a little bit. One of the things we've talked about so often here is this notion that um, you can save money by, by running a police department on overtime. Um, I've never been able to see numbers actually crunched on that, but it sure seems to me that over a period of time, you're going to be better off if you just 
bite the bullet and hire yes. people yes. because even though you have to pay all those benefits and everything, um, you you have people who are working 40 or 50 hour shifts, it not 100 hour shifts. It, it absolutely wears them yeah. out. Well, f well, first of all, let me tell you why it's bad because the argument would be made, it's cheaper to pay them overtime because we don't have to pay them benefits. Well, mm -hmm. overtime you pay more, so you know that, that savings is minimized. Mm -hmm. Also, what you're doing is you're taking police officers who have already worked an eight hour day and mm -hmm. you're transferring them yeah. to a yeah. district you're not familiar with, sometimes just to sit in cars mm -hmm. and to establish a presence. But it, 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 can, it, can, it can wear you down. Yeah. It can absolutely wear you down. So you have less, less efficiency. Uh, you have less efficiency. Plus, by, by drawing officers from one district to another district, uh, you know, at times you actually undermine the integrity of the beats in the districts from which they're being drawn from. So at the end of the day, it's not an efficient use of resources. You are simply better off hiring more resources. I said, uh, Terry Hillier told me, he was a, 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 twice the police superintendent, in, 19, in 1993, that he needed 13,500 police officers mm -hmm. in order to in order to maintain beat integrity and the special units. And about 1,100 of those. And 1,200 were 12 detectives. To be and, detectives. And the ratios of sergeants and uh, officers needed to be one to ten, mm -hmm. and that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And we stabilized it. We didn't play the, uh, you know, we said, look, the police budget is going to be secured. We're going to provide consistency and continuity in the funding, um, and so that. Uh, uh, so, you know, and then the crime rate began to decline, the, you know, the uh, public safety, the numbers all started moving in the right direction. So the point is... But uh, what, in those years, we were having 900, uh, 941 murders in yeah, 1992. Yeah, but then I think three or four years later, they were dropping into the 500s, 400s. So, the, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, crime... And it, just in Chicago, you saw mm -hmm. crime uh, fall in yeah. many other cities. So, yes, that's the yeah. reason we put the extra officers on the street. But the point that I want to make is, is that it's a, it's, it, it's a lot of waste. It's wasted money just to be basically spending hundreds of millions of dollars over a period of four to five years on overtime when you could have hired more officers, when you could sustain that level of police staffing so that... And by the way, so younger you officers that you could be moving in so that you're looking, you're building the future with younger officers. Also, the pensions. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, when you have yeah. a diminished, when you have a diminished officer core, when, you, when your numbers are diminished, there's less officers paying into the pension system. Also, because we now have tier two pension funding, because, you know, the Constitution said you can't change the benefits uh, for existing employees, but mm -hmm. but you can uh, pr offer different pension benefits, less expensive pension benefits, and, and and require greater contributions from new employees. So you know, having a larger force with younger employees in the tier two pension mm -hmm. system, in effect, helps your pension funds long term. So it, it's simply been financially irresponsible to spend the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, in overtime that they have been spending because they haven't been able to staff at the at the uh, at the levels that we staffed in when I was budget director. Have you read the DOJ and the uh, uh, Police Convoling Task Force reports? Yeah, I, you know I've seen it. I, I've gone over the task force reports. Um, I mean, again, there, we we have literally spent tens of hours talking about those reports here at, at this table, and it's very it's difficult to sort of combine them into a couple of questions, but um, one, of the, one of the big issues is training. Uh, of course. As, as you well know, both, both reports were uh, just highly critical of the way the Chicago Police Department trains its officers. Uh, you know, sometimes the only thing they get is a little bit of uh, target practice, yes. and that's it. Yes. Well, they, up until recently, they received no training in how to deal with uh, uh, individuals who have mental health issues. Right. If you remember, the mayor closed those mental health centers, and basically you had more people with serious mental health problems on the street with the police with no... Tr First of all, the, when the dispatch is sent, etc., you know, when that individual is encountered, you know, they don't... There's no training. They, they don't know what, uh, whether or not that person uh, has mental health issues, mm -hmm. and, they, and they don't know how to deal with it, even mm -hmm. if they did. So that lack of training has created problems. And look, the absence of, of, of effective training, the absence of effective command and control, the absence, uh, the failure to provide police officers with tasers. Um, my sons not only received tasers the first day on the job, they were also tased. <laughs> because mm -hmm. remember when we were in the Army, we had to go through the gap, you know, the, you know we had to 
you know, take the mask yeah, off. Oh, yeah, and yeah. We had to go into the gas, you know, the gas chamber and mm -hmm. things like that. Well, you know, they, you know, and the pep, the pepper spray, whatever they use, whatever tools they have, they have to go through the experience mm -hmm. because they wanted to send a signal that these are not toys. These are these are these are devices that you have to exercise great discretion at to use. But my point is, look at the lawsuits that we paid out. You want to talk about? Since 2011, 2011 through 2017, the numbers aren't, uh, I haven't been able to get the final numbers, it's almost $300 million in lawsuits. Mm -hmm. $300 million in lawsuits since 2004, since we're taking a, a trip down memory lane. Uh, 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 since 2004, $641 million of taxpayers' money mm -hmm. going to settle lawsuits. You know, look, there's going to be a consent decree um, that we're going to have to implement. And, and there's going to be some, whatever the compromise is on civilian oversight, there's going to be some civilian representation uh, on, uh, you know, on, on police oversight. You know, I support, I don't support civilian control. Uh, I support civilian representation because you, that helps with transparency. But the bottom line here is, is uh, nothing, there's no substitute, there's no substitute for having uh, 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 the right number of police, the right number of detectives, and, and the, the command and control in place to hold people accountable, and the training and the alternatives to the use of, le of, of lethal force to make sure that the police department can operate more effectively and also more responsibly. What about relations with, with organized labor? I mean, it seems to me that the, the city administration and the FOP are getting further and further apart all the time. And some of that, I think, has to do with the fact that the police essentially hired a more militant union uh, because of various issues that they had with the city of Chicago. But I mean, this is something that a mayor really has to begin to deal with. The, because so many of the issues that, that the public is concerned about with, with the police and that, you know, uh, academics are concerned about, these things, uh, they end up being organized labor issues. They become collective bargaining issues. I believe. Can you fix something like that? Well, I, I believe I can because I've always had a great relationship with the unions that I've dealt with. And you remember the contentious relationship with the union and the, um, with the teachers union back mm -hmm. prior to uh, me becoming CEO. They had what? Uh, in like 15 years, they had seven or eight work stoppages or delays in school starting or whatever. And, you know, of course, they had that, you know, they had that very damaging strike a number of years earlier. Um, it took us three weeks to balance our first budget. It was a three-year affordable budget, and we had six years. Then three years later, we, we, uh, we nego I mean, it took us uh, three weeks to uh, negotiate a collective bargaining agreement, an affordable a collective bargaining agreement. Sorry about that. And then with, uh, three years later, we negotiated a second agreement, also affordable. My approach with, with the union was to really involve them in the process. And, to, uh, and involving them in the process meant, meant meeting with them, me meeting with them, literally every month and to resolve problems to I brought them into the budget process I allowed them to see what I would what I saw I, I allowed them to look at the information that I had access to I wanted to let them uh, you know I want them wanted them to become a full partner uh, in, uh, in in terms of their level of participation and in providing input uh, as I developed my long-term financial and, and, and programmatic strategic plan. Uh, so, you know, when they see what you're trying to do, when they see what your goals are, when they see what your strategies are, and how those goals and strategies are actually going to help their members, they, are, they tend to be more accommodating. The, the union always accommodated me financially because they knew what the financial conditions were, and they knew that I was trying to set priorities with the limited resources I had that would benefit their members. When, you know, <laughs> you as an executive, you need to be inclusive and, and you need to view uh, them as partners uh, because when they're kept out and they're pushed out and when they really don't understand what your priorities are, uh, when you're trading out police officers, when you're gutting the divisions, uh, when you're basically uh, nickel and diming and making decisions, you're, you're not providing their, their officers with, uh, with tasers or taser training. When, the tas when, when, when they see those things, they naturally become more entrenched. And then they start, 
they start fighting you on every issue, you see. So my approach has, has always been to be inclusive, to involve them, in, you know, to, uh, to involve the, uh, uh, the FOP, to the community, the activists uh, uh, in the process so that they can have input and they can see what we see and they can understand what we're trying to do in order to improve public safety and accountability simultaneously. And I think when you do that, the collective bargaining units have a tendency to be much more cooperative and much more accommodating. Mayor Emanuel wants to build a, I think, $90 million training facility. Would you uh, carry that on? Yeah, I support it, and I think it should be located on the west side. When I was city budget director, I, I convinced the mayor to locate the police headquarters on, on 35th and, um, you know, um, and not State Mich Street, the, yeah, the Michigan. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, uh, b at the time when public housing, the public housing, w was still along the State Street corridor, and because I felt it would anchor the community, and so uh, yeah, my question about the uh, uh, about the academy is whether or not the footprint is large enough, because you need a, a rifle range, you need a driving range, you, you need a an area where uh, uh, a, where they can do physical education, so that you're not courting off the streets as the police officers are, you know, doing their PT, their physical training up and down the streets. So, you know, the, my question is more about whether or not the site is adequate to 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 uh, provide for a modern uh, police training center that is not going to be obsolete the day it. it it opens, and, and that's my concern. But I've also recommended in, in my proposals, in my proposal, that we create a leadership academy, uh, and other cities have it. And the idea here is to make that leadership academy uh, a part of the police training academy, and that leadership academy would be the academy where we train, uh, where we do two things. We train the next generation of, 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 of uh, leaders, uh, you know, the next, uh, and, and the academy becomes a vehicle for uh, police officers with innovative practices, police officers who are doing things innovative, uh, in, uh, who are doing innovative things at the local district level that's having success, where they can go and have their ideas and initiatives, whether the commanders or for that matter, the, a patrol officer, a rookie patrol officer, uh, where they can go and have their ideas uh, uh, vetted and, 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 and replicated if, if, if those ideas are having great success. There are individual districts where commanders and their officers are, 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 are having great success and some of those best practices need to be identified, need to be uh, vetted, and, and need to be replicated. So, uh, you know, so making, creating a leadership academy that is part of, part of the police training academy will, will be able to kind of drive instruction and drive innovation. You know, in the military, the War College Command and General Staff College drive all military innovation. innovation. And who, who are the instructors, who are the individuals who s serve in the War College Command and General Staff College? Officers who just completed their command or they've take, taken a break from their command so that they can go in and they can mm -hmm. download what they've seen and what they've done and, 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 and where they can communicate some of their innovative ideas so that it becomes an organic process of constantly improving training and constantly improving tactics. So I believe that the Leadership Academy should be a part of the training academy. Lori Lightfoot, before she was a candidate for mayor, was here and said that she opposes the idea because uh, she agrees with community organizers who say that uh, that money could be spent more effectively on the prevention side rather than the training side. You can't uh, have you can't have improved training without a modern training facility. Period. Mm -hmm. And and you just can't. And anybody who says that you can, uh, you know, there are cities that are paying a heck of a lot more than they've budgeted for that training academy. So it just can't happen. Just because of looking at the clock here, okay, uh, a radical change. Although All right. there is there is a connective tissue here. You were talking about the unions, and you were talking about your relationship with the CTU when you were CEO of CPS, and um, that was, uh, as as I recall it, that was the United Progressive Caucus the, uh, with the CTU. Not long after you left. There was a kind of a revolution within the CTU and CORE, the whatever that is, Congress of Rank and File Educators, yeah. uh, really kind of threw all the leadership of the CTU out, and a, a big part of the of the argument that they were making is that um, your your and other other you and other leaders 
we're moving more toward a corporatized kind of education, a privatized education, that you were, uh, you were the first to embrace charter schools, uh, right. that, that, that you and Arne Duncan sort of brought into the system this kind of privatized ethos. Right. All right, so let me respond to that. First of all, I think there's been, since Tom Reese passed away, uh, since Tom Reese lost, there's been one, two, three, maybe four union presidents. Uh, you know, uh, Debbie Lynch succeeded uh, Tom Reese. Uh, Debbie Lynch has supported me, so she's enthusiastically supported me. She's part of my, you know, my mm -hmm. education brain trust. So, so the individuals who worked with me, uh, 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 Pam Mazarski was number two in teachers' union because Tom, Tom Reese passed away. Uh, she's very active in my campaign. So all the union leaders that I worked with are part of my campaign. Uh, let me point out uh, on the issue of privatization because, you know, so that there's no misinformation out there. We only chartered 15 schools, and we had 558 schools. And you, uh, you remember that the reason the charter school law was enacted was because at, at the time, the Republicans, the Senate was controlled Illinois by... Illinois was Republican. You remember once. that. Yeah. James Pate Phillip controlled mm -hmm. the Senate, a actually for more than a short period. Mm -hmm. And he was an advocate of, for vouchers. And, uh, and uh, of course, believe it or not, it was a two-year period when Michael Madigan was not the Speaker of the House, Lee Daniels. Mm -hmm. And they were pushing to charter the Chicago system. And the Democratic compromise was charter schools. Or they wanted to voucher the voucher system. Voucher the sorry. system, not yeah, charter. Yeah, they were yeah. pushing to voucher the entire system. Mm -hmm. And the Democratic, uh, led by Art Berman at the time, uh, uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee, mm -hmm. which uh, committee that w my first job was working for Art Berman, uh, before I went to work for 10 years with, for Don Clark Netsch. But, uh, but the alternative was to, to do charter schools. Uh, they said, look, uh, this is our alternative. This is the Democratic proposal. So the state enacted the charter school law. Uh, when I left, we had 558 schools and 15 charter schools. Today they have 120 charter schools. So, you know, uh, uh, we did charter schools as an alternative. Uh, and, but we didn't close school. We didn't need to close schools in the process because our enrollment grew by 30,000 during that period. It's the only period in the last 30 years that enrollment actually grew. So we got considerably more, considerable more uh, state funding because our enrollment was growing. And, you know, we didn't open charter schools right next to thriving traditional public schools. So, so there was a balance. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I'll let the people who succeeded me uh, you know, defend themselves and defend their records. What but, did you think of uh, Mayor Daley's Renaissance 2010 program? That was that came in with uh, not probably not long after you left. Uh, this was we're going to revolutionize the system yeah. and we're going to bring in all these charters and private schools and uh, whatever well, it takes. Uh, and yeah. it, uh, I would I think we could objectively say, looking back at it, that it was um, it didn't work a failure. Yeah, it, well, it didn't work because let me tell you for two reasons. One is they they created overcapacity. They certainly uh, did. But this and, and and incidentally that that was announced like two years after after I was gone. And I remember the first year after I was gone, the Tribune did an editorial, and you could do a, a, a search saying, why did Paul Vallis leave? You're not making any changes, okay? Mm -hmm. well, what mm -hmm. was different, you know? And, uh, and I left on my own, but clearly it was time for me to move on. Uh, and I also left to run for governor. Right. And I only lost by one and a half percent. I'm oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I looked it up yesterday and I saw three percent. I know that. When it, it's yeah. like, it's like a, <laughs> I have it tattooed. No one can see it. When it the, but anyway, but uh, you must you must think from time to time about that. Like I came that close and and, you know, I wouldn't have gone well, to prison. Well, I have to tell you, uh, uh, you know, I testified in uh, I, I want to uh, speak to the Indiana Board of Education about some reform issues. It's, and so they said, just think, you could have been elected governor in the state of Illinois. Where would you be today? And my response was, well, I would either be in my fourth term or in jail. Yeah. <laughs> and they, and they looked at Illinois. me and they said, do you realize that four out of the last seven <laughs> Illinois governors have gone to jail? Yeah. So I don't know what the odds are here. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, so, but, but let me just say uh, 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 what my problems were with Renaissance 2010. Uh, Renaissance 2010 uh, 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 cr began to create overcapacity. What they also did was they shut down schools and they dispatched the kids from those existing schools to other communities. That, I think that destabilized the schools and that destabilized the communities so that they could open then these new schools as kind of these freestanding yeah. charter schools. And I think that, that, was, not, uh, that was not a good strategy. And, and, and I think it hurt, and I think it hurt the, uh, 
uh, I believe it, 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 it hurt the, the, uh, the school system. And, and, and if you remember during that period, crime began to spike. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, you know, I just think you want to stabilize neighborhoods. And what's critical to stable neighborhoods is, is having schools. It's schools. And, and that's why I, I was, all right, maybe I should have closed a, a few schools, but our enrollment was, was rising. Yeah. And we were, we were generating huge cash reserves. But the point is, uh, you know, if you're going to close the school, uh, uh, you know, you don't close the school that has a large number of kids uh, uh, and dispatch them to neighborhood schools and then reopen that school as a brand new school that has open enrollment and is not in, it, and, and is not a school that's created to serve the community. So it's, community schools are critically important. Community schools are a, a, are a critical uh, uh, are a critical backbone, uh, a critical part of the backbone of the community. And, 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 and uh, it, look, even the strategy of closing 50 schools, you know, if you're going to close a school, you should never close a school that's p performing. You should find a way to get more kids into that underperforming school, even if you bust them or whatever. Uh, uh, and if you're going to close the school, then have a plan to repurpose the building. Yeah, yeah, you know, there are yeah. huge numbers of, of individuals Age 17 to 40, uh, dropouts, chronically unemployed, ex-offenders, etc. Uh, uh, some of these numbers outnumber uh, the the number of students in those neighborhood high schools. Uh, you know, you could easily repurpose those buildings and convert them into adult ed and occupational training centers. So have a strategy. Have a strategy to make. Right now, we have dozens of buildings sitting in poor neighborhoods. Uh, deteriorating, some of which were renovated 20 years ago by me. By you, yeah. Deteriorating, yeah, yeah. losing property value. Mm -hmm. That's why, when when the the archdiocese was going to 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 uh, abandon Mendel, remember the old Mendel yeah. St. Martin yeah. de Porres uh, uh, High School, uh, 40 uh, in acres, the wasn't it? Something like that. Right. Huge. The Augustinians. I went to the Augustinians who 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 owned the property, and I said. Sell me the property and I'll maintain the school and mm -hmm. I'll maintain the school there. And they sold me the property for two and a half million dollars and we built Southside College Prep, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. And, uh, and, and that is a majestic, dynamic school in the heart of the Rosen community. Imagine if you had those 40 vacant acres with decaying buildings today. Mm -hmm. So you've got mm -hmm. to have a strategy. So I, I believe Renaissance 2010 was, uh, was, uh, was, was ill-conceived. Uh, uh, and, uh, and Can I interrupt you just yes. because we're, I mean, we literally have just a couple of minutes That's left okay. here. I'm getting so jealous of every second. The we guy can who do so a second hour if you'd like. Okay. <laughs> we, all right. We'll no, we won't to torture people. <laughs> um, the guy who sold all of that to Mayor Daley was Arne Duncan, and then he went on to become the uh, Secretary of Education under Barack Obama, and he sold that to the whole country. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very critical of him. Uh, are you one of them? Well, he's not superintendent now, and, and I'm not running against Arne Duncan or Mayor Daley. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just I also asking tend as, to as think a, an educator who, who's been all over the place and done all these yeah. things. You must have seen that... All right, let me, let me phrase this question a little bit differently. Yeah. One of the things we've talked about here a lot that, that I think is just a real tragedy is the, these grand old uh, neighborhood high schools that have just been allowed to just die in... just just to just drop dead. And it's partly because of all the things you've been talking about. It's because of policies. The, those, schools were, those schools were vital. They, they played an important role in holding school, the neighborhoods together. What did we do wrong? Why are they dead? Well, how much time do we have to talk about these things? Look, I, you know, I Can believe- Can you give me 45 me seconds that, on that? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, I believe that the financial, uh, uh, you know, the financial problems in the schools really begin to escalate after Ernie leaves in 2008. And you can look at the, the pension funding, you can look at everything, because contrary to popular belief- I want to ask you about student-based uh, budgeting, so, too. So, <laughs> but, but the point that I want to make is, you're, and, 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 and believe me, major education initiatives like Renaissance 2010 and things like that are, are driven by City Hall. Yeah. All right, so, so but, but this is the point. Uh, um, my point is you have to have a strategy you have to have a, your, your education strategy, your, your financial strategy for the schools has got to be to construct budgets and long-term financial plans that, that are in effect education improvement vehicles and then invest in the type of programs and initiatives that are gonna increase your enrollment. That's why we open the uh, magnet schools in, 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 in every region. That's why we, we put 
18 international baccalaureate programs in neighborhood high schools and our language academy programs. And that's why we opened the military academies. We, the goal was to make the system more attractive, to provide more quality traditional choices. Those, were, those weren't charter schools, there were traditional schools. And our enrollment grew. Uh, part of the problem that the schools have faced is declining enrollment because schools are funded based on their average daily attendance. Mm -hmm. And when there's declining enrollment, right. and, you know, all it does is it, it just undermines the financial stability of the district. When you're losing 20, 30, 40 million dollars in state aid every year uh, over a period of time. So, so we developed a growth strategy and, and, and that's what you have to do uh, with the uh, school budget. Okay. I, I want to go on for hours. I mean, I, I really yeah, literally but I don't could think talk to you for the rest of the day, and they don't, they don't want either of us <laughs> to do this. Your campaign, I've heard you say that you're going to probably have little or no TV. Oh, How, no, I didn't say that. I, I thought I heard you say that. I said we're not going to have the type of TV that he's going to have. Oh, all yeah, right. Yeah, so the question, we're not going to... I was going to, I mean, you, you no, can't, you no, can't of course win, we're you can't have win against yeah. Ron Emanuel, no yeah, TV. We're gonna, you can't look, do it. we're going to raise enough money. I think people will be surprised by the amount of money that we are, are going to... Uh, be able to raise and and you know at the end of June we'll have a we'll have our our, our next uh, update uh, okay. you're required to submit the you know financial updates you have to have supporters you have to have like large groups of supporters if you look at the map and you see where all the people vote for all the people, where's where's where are you on the map where are the people who are going to vote for, for Paul Vallis well look you know I want the campaign to be a referendum on issues uh, but who's offering substantive solutions to deal with the complicated problems that the city is facing and, and what I've tried, and what I've tr even tried here, is, is to articulate what I'm going to do to strengthen uh, the police department. Uh, and, and again, if you create the proper infrastructure, you'll have greater accountability. Uh, um, you know, I, I'm going to uh, have a policy uh, uh, press conference on education probably next month. I'm going to talk about infrastructure. I'm going to talk about the state budget, progressive taxes. You know, I'm going to try to address all those issues. So my path to victory is to is to go out there and to visit every community, to visit every neighborhood, and to get the word out, and to uh, do every talk show, do every <laughs> podcast, even the mayor's podcast, if you'll invite me. That's right. We, we were just talking about that. I heard you talking to Dick Kay about that the other day. And I, yeah, I, I was thinking, wow, I would like to have the concession to sell the tickets to that, to have you appear on Rahm Emanuel's uh, uh, podcast. Well, you know, the, uh, yeah. we got to go. OK. We really have to go. Well, thanks. I'm, they're, it's great they're to see you again. At me. Um, I hope you'll come back sometime. I will, anytime. Right. OK. And, um, like I said, when you're when you're mayor, we'll have to come over and do the show for right. your office. All right, it'll okay. become a regular. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Paul Vallis, thank you very much for being our Thanks guest for today. Me. It's the first of our ten interviews with the candidates for mayor. That's if Rahm Emanuel will agree to come over here. We don't know. We, maybe he will. Um, and if he does, that's ten, and whoever else joins in later on. Thank you to Paul Vallis for being here today. My name is Ken Davis. You're watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a production of Can TV. A big special thanks to David Resnick, who is uh, our producer and who is helping pull all sorts of, sorts of things together and pull this show together for us today. And I appreciate that very much. Um, we'll be back next week with another discussion about Chicago and hope you'll join us. And you can see all of our shows by going to our archives, which are right here at this location. You can hear us on our podcast on Apple Tunes, uh, iTunes, or on um, SoundCloud. Oh, there's just a million ways. We'll come and do the show in your garage if you'd like, whatever, whatever you need to do. Thanks for watching us. See you next week. Bye.